the media uploaded by LGBT Anonymous does not represent the Anonymous movement or the LGBT movement. They are just ideas that have been thought of as worth watching due to the fact that they promote the freeing of humanity in some way shape or form. If you would like to learn and grow with us then please subscribe, join our social networks and feel free to email us with content that you would like to see uploaded to our channel. We at LGBT Anonymous acknowledge and support all gender identities. Hi, I'm Derek Jensen. This is Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network. My guest today is Cherry Smiley. She's an indigenous feminist activist and artist from the Thompson and Navajo Nations and an accomplished public speaker on sexualized violence against indigenous women and girls. She's a founding member of the unfunded group Indigenous Women Against the Sex Industry, IWASI, and current campaign coordinator for the Feminist Alliance for International Action's Campaign of Solidarity with Aboriginal Women, a campaign focused on Canada's missing and murdered Aboriginal women and girls. So first, thank you for your work, and second, thank you for being on this program. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Derek, for inviting me to be here, and thank you for your work as well. Oh, thank you. So, um, tell me about the missing and murdered Aboriginal women and girls in Canada. That That is something that perhaps a lot of people don't know about, especially not in Canada, and, and more people should. Um, it's true. I mean, the, the issue is really... Uh quite huge so I'll try and, and break it break it down kind of the best I can so um, over the past I guess really kind of 30 20 20 to 30 years there's there's been rumblings um, in different communities across uh, across Canada Aboriginal communities um, that you know women are going missing so these are our aunties our, our mothers our sisters daughters um, and and so over that that time frame but especially really in the last kind of decade um, a variety of organizations. So this this is including family members, um, Aboriginal women's organizations, uh, women's organizations. Um, you know, kind of the the national Aboriginal organizations we have as well. But but mostly, I would say coming really from a grassroots level. So you're looking at you know family members, um, Aboriginal women um, who've really started to make a lot of noise about uh, the murders and disappearances. Um, so what happened was in 2010, so I guess four years ago now, uh, the Native Women's Association of Canada. So in, in Canada, we have five national Aboriginal organizations and a one, only one of them is, a, is an Aboriginal women's organization. So that's the Native Women's Association of Canada or NWAC released this report uh, and they had done this research into, into the murders and disappearances and they had come up with a number um, of 582 missing and murdered Aboriginal women. I believe it was over a 30 year period. Um, so, and this was groundbreaking because this is the first time that anybody had actually uh, done research and began looking at numbers. And because of the uh, difficulty in, in terms of um, police often not taking reports uh, when, when women have been reported missing or police misidentifying the race or not including the race, um, NWAC was somewhat limited in, in the scope of, of the research, um, but still they came out with, with this number of, of 582, which um, to some people may not sound like, like that many women, but because the Aboriginal population of Canada is um, disproportionate, you know, much smaller than the non-Native population, 582 um, is equivalent to approximately, I think it's either 18 or 19,000 uh, people in the non-native population. So that's a significant proportion of our, our women and girls that are going missing and being murdered. And the other thing that was really significant um, in that research that they did was how many of these women were actually girls when they went missing um, and were murdered. So you're looking at, you know, 15, 16, 17 year old teenage girls um, who are being, you know, violated and, and, and murdered. Um, a lot of those murders uh, were and continue to remain um, unsolved, um, and same same with the disappearances. So this kind of happened in in 2010, and 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 uh, you know since then and before then, um, the kind of momentum and and the awareness on this issue has been really increasing. Um, 
in 2014, yes, this year, um, the RCMP, so this is the RCMP themselves who are oftentimes, um, you know, not responding to uh, police reports and things like that. So the RCMP themselves, which is the Canadian police, um, did their own investigation and they came up with a number of uh, 1,000, what is it, I believe 1,182 um, over that same 30-year period. So that's almost double um, the NWAC number. Um, and I'm just going to double double check my number here. Um, but it was over 1,100 anyways, um, missing and murdered Aboriginal women. So that's, you know, if we were to, you know, equivalent that to the non-Native population, that's that's almost double that 18 or, or 19,000 um, equivalent in the non-Native population. So, um, and what's what's partially so disturbing is that the list keeps growing. So this isn't a problem that we're looking at that happened in the past, you know, and this was awful and, you know, people say sorry or, or whatever, right? Um, this kind of, uh, you know, uh, not really meaningful kind of reaction that we've had to things like residential schools and, you know, things that supposedly in Canada. So, um, so this is, continues to happen, um, and Aboriginal women and girls are continuing to go missing and being murdered in disproportionate numbers. It, it, we're looking at a human rights crisis in Canada. So, uh, what? I mean, it, it, I'm almost not even sure what to ask because it's it kind of boggles my mind. This is not like, you know, seven women from one community who who could be who could have been killed by one person i mean this is not uh, this is not this is not some sort of we can't easily point a finger at one crazy person like the the what was his name picton or the the pig mm -hmm. farmer who mm -hmm. murdered however many women this this is this is obviously a larger why don't i just shut up and ask you so what's happening well, I mean, it's it's true. This isn't one. This isn't the work of one uh, crazy man or one isolated incident, right? This is, um, you know, the the most kind of grave um, injustices and violations on a systemic level. So these, this is, um, I mean, it's a result of so many factors, but um, one of those has has definitely been the um, colonial devaluation of Aboriginal women and girls since, you know, contact or, or invasion or however you want to, you know, frame that. Um, so I, I know from my, my story, I was uh, raised very closely, um, raised very much so by my maternal grandmother. And I hear these stories all the time about, you know, she, she calls them the old people. So she'll say, oh, you know, the old people, you know, they used to do things like this. And, you know, women were treated like this and, and women, you know, were valued and, and, you know, had leadership positions. And, and really the not to say that that, uh, you know, pre-contact, everything was, was perfect, because, of course, it wasn't. But these systemic inequalities that we're dealing with today didn't exist. Um, pre-contact. So I have this kind of sense of what, what things were like. Um, and my, the way that I think about it is, is you know, and, and that many other Aboriginal women do, of course, um, is once um, the white settlers came over, um, men realized that these women, our, our Aboriginal women and girls, had positions of, of power and leadership and we were valued and treated with respect. Um, and there was a, a, a systemic... Uh, construction of, of, of these really horrible racist um, ideas about Aboriginal women as being kind of this, this Indian princess or these, these dirty squaws, right? Um, so we kind of get uh, constructed in, in these really um, non-human uh, ways. And, and once you kind of frame somebody as being not human, it, it becomes very easy to, to then violate them, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and that was partially... Um, you know, for for better access to our lands and our resources, right? So we need to get it, and our, our women often say we're the hearts of the nation. So we need to get at the heart of the nation, and we need to attack these Aboriginal people where it hurts, and that's going to be at their women and their girls, so that we can systemically, you know, uh, you know, uh, try to get rid of them so we can access their, their lands and resources. When you said the... Um 
the Indian princess or the dirty squaw, is that I'm just thinking of the sort of pornographic trope of either the virgin, well, which is also the Christian trope, of either the virgin or the whore. And is that is that are those the equivalent of that? Yeah, I I, I would definitely say that. I mean, I, I kind of call it the the, the Indian equivalent um, of the kind of the Madonna or the whore, and um, and that itself is it right is a, a symptom of of patriarchy. So so we're not just you know it's it becomes very hard to separate all these really oppressive systems at play, right? So yes, we are talking about colonialism and racism, but that is so intertwined with with patriarchy um, and the ways that all women um, get treated and violated by men and, and male privilege in, in a patriarchal system, but how that plays out in very particular ways um, and particular types of, um, uh, you know, exceptionally harmful, uh, very violent, very degrading. Uh, so it's like violence plus that gets committed against Aboriginal women and girls simply for the fact that we are Aboriginal women and girls. So that, that, provides sort of a a really quick overview of some of the political or social or cultural um, um, drives that 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 are 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 pushing this this the, these disappearances and murderers murders but um what and I realize we're talking about more than more than eleven 1, hundred women so we have you know 1100 different circumstances but but what what is actually happening is this is this happening all over canada from the east coast to the west coast and from the south to the north and um, or is it more localized is this and 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 the are they are are a lot of the the missing women who have the cases have been solved are those um, stranger violations, or are they um, known to the people? And what what do we actually know about what's physically happening to all these women? What what are so, some of the commonalities? Sure. So, I mean, the greatest commonality of all is that is that these are these women and girls are, are Aboriginal, and that's you know how what a what a sad statement to say that that in itself becomes you know a, a risk factor um, in terms of of being violated or, or being killed or um, or raped or, or whatever. So, um, it, and it is happening. It is across country where we are looking, you know, uh, you know, north, um, north to south, um, east to west. So it, it's, it's happening in, um, you know, uh, smaller communities. It's happening in big cities. Um, it's, it's, uh, you know, the, the situation, the, the world that Aboriginal women and girls live in today is one where, um, you know, and I've heard this said before that that oftentimes Aboriginal uh, girls, and I know myself growing up, it's not a matter of if I get raped, it's when I get raped. Um, and it's this, you know, you're living in this this climate that where it, you know, you're at risk of of kind of death or disappearance. My my grandmother, I, I'm very fortunate to be able to do this work um, in many different places, and whenever I I go somewhere, my grandmother will keep calling my phone <laughs> uh, when I get there. Um, and she'll keep calling until I pick up. And that's because my grandmother is afraid that one of these times I'm not going to pick up and I'm not going to make it to my destination. So it's not as if um, class makes a difference. So whether you have a lot of money or you don't, whether you're in university or, you know, you're being prostituted on the street, um, none of those factors really matter. You're still um, at risk of uh, of violence by men. And that's the other that's the other really common factor, right? And unfortunately, it's one that doesn't get talked about enough. Um, I find in, in the media framing, oftentimes, is we, we talk about the murders and disappearances, but we talk about the disappearances as if these women and girls just kind of disappeared into thin air. Like one day they were there and the next day they, they weren't. So it's, it's really important that we talk about who's doing what to who. Um, and in this case, it, it's men um, who are violating and murdering and raping Aboriginal women and girls. And it's um, definitely you're at increased risk as an Aboriginal woman and girl of, of stranger violence. So that's much more common place um, in terms of, you know, we see the, the Highway of Tears in northern British Columbia. I live currently in, on unceded Coast Salish territories in Vancouver. So in, in my province in the northern um, area, there's a highway along there where they've had... Um, 
a number, a number of, of women and girls, but mostly Aboriginal women and girls go missing along this, this particular stretch of highway. Um, and that's, you know, that's a result of, of stranger, uh, you know, stranger violence. But the other half of that, that becomes a little bit more difficult to talk about is the fact that oftentimes our own men in our own community, so our fathers, um, and husbands, um, boyfriends, are, are oftentimes um, violating, incesting, uh, uh, battering um, women in their own communities. And that's, you know, that's the as a result of that Im that implementation of patriarchy into our communities and that little benefit, that very small benefit that Aboriginal men get from a, from a patriarchy, right? So um, that the violence starts very young, oftentimes, and it and it just doesn't it just doesn't stop. So um, it's it's devastating. So. Um... And you don't you don't have to do this if you don't want, but I'm thinking that. Um, well, I want to tell a real quick story, which is that um, something that I I have said at several talks to talk about male privilege is that I was on tour one time and ended up in um, my planes were late. And since you travel a lot doing talks, I know you know how unromantic touring is. <laughs> um, sure. Yeah, so I, I, you know, my plane gets into Moline, Illinois at like one o'clock in the morning and I catch a shuttle to my hotel and the nearest uh, place I can eat, I get into the hotel maybe 1.30 and the nearest place I can eat is a Denny's. It's about a mile down a deserted highway and I haven't eaten all day because the planes are all late, you know, I'm just in airports. And so I start walking to the Denny's and I walk past this empty McDonald's and there's a white van parked in there. And as I walk by the van, they start up and I get kind of scared. And at that point, I'll stop and I'll ask the audience. So especially you women, at that point, would you run back to the room? And all the women in the audience say, are you kidding? I get in at 1.30 in the morning. I am not walking down a deserted highway. Right. <laughs> and... You know, as opposed to as a guy, it's like I didn't get worried until a van starts up like three feet from me. Mm. And so I'm just wondering. And so my question after all this little story is, um, can you can you give. OK, there's two levels here. One is being a woman and the other is being an aboriginal woman in this society. Can The question is, what is it like to be you? And um, so can you give, I mean, you've said one example of your grandmother calls you um, concerned every time you fly anywhere, which I think probably does not happen to your typical CEO who travels somewhere. Right. Um, <laughs> so their grandmas, yeah, probably not. <laughs> I'm sorry, what? Yeah, they're, they're probably not checking in with their grandmas. That's true. <laughs> yeah. So, so just... Can you can you differentiate for me what it's like to be a woman facing that? And then in addition, just like on day to day, like like an example like I just gave with, you know, I'm hungry and it's one o'clock in the morning, so I'm going to walk to Denny's and you might simply have to stay hungry all night. And then also what it's like to be an aboriginal woman as opposed to a, a woman from settler society in this culture. So. I, I know for my myself, um, like I, it, it's really actually. So I one time I was doing these presentations and um, I was invited to go to these uh, communities, these reserves, uh, reservations um, in British Columbia, and you know talk about sexual violence and those types of things. And I, I often find that those types of, of talks they get constructed as if I need to go and and you know give these women safety tips. Right. Like I need to, to teach women how to be safe. And the, the fact of the matter is that Aboriginal women and girls grow up. We already know that we're not safe. Like we don't we don't need to be taught that. Um, so you, you grow up with this um, with this. Well, I, I did anyways. Um, fear that kind of, you know, uh, manifests itself um, in, in a number of different ways. And I find that, you know, as a girl growing up in a home where there was a lot of violence, um, 
you know, I'm going out and I'm doing these speaking engagements and I'm talking about these things, but there is this, um, you know, there's a, like an, an, un, an unsurety in myself. Um, it, it, uh, that that's kind of always always kind of there right and that that the kind of larger society has this messaging for aboriginal women and when it comes especially to the murders and disappearances and that messaging is that you don't matter so it doesn't matter you know i i have a i i I don't like to to brag at all and i very rarely bring it up but i have a i have a master's degree and you know I've, i've done some things in my life um but that messaging is so strong um that that tells me that I don't matter and what I think doesn't matter and that I don't even uh that 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 I should be thankful kind of that I have this privilege of, of being alive so it, it manifests itself it, itself in 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 ways like um you know ways where I'm have this kind of constant um fear is what it is right um and this unsurety um in myself and you know I when I'm back home in Vancouver and we have an area in Vancouver called the downtown east side and that, that's where Picton was most active so it's a very poor neighborhood the the poverty and the prostitution and and drug use and and alcoholism is very visible in this neighborhood I remember having a discussion one time with this woman and she was telling me oh you know it's it's you know it's it's very much a community there and you know that that the the media frames it and it does um as you know being you know this this really terrible place where you know people are all on drugs and doing crazy things and um you know and she's like you know it's really great when I go down there and and she was this young white woman uh who was in school and you know I go down there and I'm talking to people you know and it's great and and they're people and uh and and I was like when I go down there I'm getting proposition for sex on every block like I'm trying pimps are trying to recruit me men are trying to buy me like that's my experience of walking down walking down that street um so it's, you know, it's, it's, it's hard, <laughs> I, I guess, is, is, um, is the reality of it. And the way that it, um, especially doing this work um, and being very fortunate to be able to do this work, I'm, I'm doing this work, um, but at the same time, when I'm talking about these issues, I'm thinking about my own family, right? So I'm thinking about my own family, my own community, my sisters, my cousins, um, and all the struggles that they're they're dealing with on a daily basis, right? Trying to survive the poverty, the violence, all those types of things, right? Um, so it does become very very difficult um, because the women that I'm talking about, all these women have faces for me, right? Like they're my family. Um, so the ways the ways that it kind of manifests itself, like in 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 the messaging, let alone the fear, right? The, the myself. Um, yeah, I don't, you know, I don't go out at night. At night, I have been the victim of, of a stranger attack. I have been, you know, the victim of, um, you know, male violence in my family. So, um, you know, there's a heightened sense of of, um, of awareness, I think. But then the way that that also uh, transcribed itself in in my life as, you know, as as a, a person who's working and who's going to school and that constant messaging that you have no value you're not worth it you have you're not even worth being alive um that that is the to me that that one's almost trickier to, to deal with um and because it's just not so uh not so obvious um i'm really sorry that you have to go through that it's um It sounds really hard. Um, I'm thinking. Uh, so let's let's go a slightly different direction for a minute. And um, what has been the? I mean, the, it's good, I guess, that the RCMP uh, revised the numbers up. Um, it's bad that they they had to revise them up, but it's 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 good that the RCMP is. It seems that they're providing some sort of. Um, they're not whitewashing the number at least at least there um what has been the relationship between how how has it been to try to work with the rcmp or local police to try to get some justice or at least resolution for some of these women 
Well, um, so I've just looked it up as well. <laughs> so the number that they came out was 1,181. 1, so I think mm -hmm. that was off by one originally. Um, is the number that their reports, their report states. Um, and I mean, even that number is potentially low because they also recognize that um, police have not taken reports when they should have or, you know, misidentified um, the victim's uh, race or, or um or not recorded it. So, um, so even that number could could be low um, in terms of the, the reality of the situation. So the, the police, um, I worked uh, for many years uh, as a uh, full time and then as a relief worker at a, at a transition house and at a rape crisis center. So, um, you know, the, across the board, um, police don't take violence against women seriously. So whether you're Aboriginal or not, um, if it's male violence against women, you know, the outcome, the excuses and, you know, well, we can't do anything. We can't arrest him, um, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, so across the board, the situation is, is not good. Um, and the police, what's difficult as well in, in these circumstances, especially with Aboriginal women and girls, um, is that oftentimes the police are, are perpetrating the violence. Um, so, uh, you know, police officers or judges, uh, we've had that situation in Northern BC as well, um, you know, uh, harming and, and violating and raping and, and sexually assaulting, um, Aboriginal women and girls. So you have that kind of additional, uh, uh, add that power onto male privilege and, and the situation is not good. So, um, in Vancouver, especially I, I find with, um, the, the the messaging is kind of interesting because for the past little while the Vancouver Police Department has basically had a, a mostly kind of hands off approach to prostitution so they aren't you know necessarily arresting the women as much um, but they definitely aren't arresting the Johns um, and they aren't targeting the Johns so um, you know the the faith um, I think in in the police and the, the fear. Uh, around calling the police, um, and then that messaging, right, that the police give, which is essentially, um, you know, we're going to allow uh, pimps and johns to purchase women, so, you know, basically you're disposable in life, and then when you do go missing or get murdy, murdered, we're not going to investigate, um, so you're disposable in death. Um, makes it really hard for Aboriginal women to um, to want to use the police, uh, and and to and when they do to have a good experience um, using the police. So I, I think policing is is a huge um, part of that system and a huge part of the problem. So what? Um, I mean, there's, there's a larger. I, I want to come back to the police in a minute, but but um, what? Since the police are not providing effective. Um, protection and in many cases are actually perpetrating um, what in addition to attempting to get the police to do the right thing um, what 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 do um, what do what do women do and what do um, what 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 how how do you how do you get justice or, or resolution or anything? Yeah, that, that's a good question. <laughs> um, I think about it a lot, and um, you know, I think sometimes uh, there can be a push for oh, you know, community, you know, uh, uh, kind of the community taking it on, right, and 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 um, themselves as opposed to looking toward the police for assistance and. I, you know, I know, I know that women, like I've, you know, seen it myself, um, and before that, you know, story, women have always done that. Um, you know, women have always tried to keep each other safe, and um, you know, uh, women going, you know, go to your to your cousin's house, right? If if you're getting, you know, your your husband or your boyfriend is beating you up, you know, you you, you take off and you, you go to your cousin's house or your auntie's house or or whatever, and. Um, you know, women kind of forming these networks, right, to really try and support each other and, you know, helping each other out, you know, with a few bucks, maybe, you know, you need you need some money because you got to get out or whatever, right? Um, so women have always, we've always put our lives on the line for each other. We've always had ways and strategies to um, try and, and deal with the violence, right, when, when the police and the governments are not. So, um, but I don't, I don't think that 
I don't think that giving up on the police is the way to go. I, I do think that um, that we really do need to hold the police accountable. Um, I know, again, working working at the transition house, there's policy, there is actual policy in play. Um, so on paper, you know, it looks all right. Um, in practice, you know, not definitely not so great. Um, but I don't think that means that we should give up um, on on holding them accountable to the policies that are working um, and to trying to get the police to actually uh, work in the interest of women. Like I, 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 I really do believe in, I mean, it will be obviously a very slow, slow change, um, very, very slow change, but I do believe in the ability um, of men to, you know, the, the, the idea of the police is so um, connected to, you know, masculinity and, and patriarchy and, you know, the, the idea of men as, as protectors and things like that. So I do believe that we can transform those those fundamental ideas um, and get to a place where, you know, men are taking, um, sorry, police are uh, police are taking violence against women um, seriously, you know, both as both as a reflection um, of our society, but also as a, um, a way to reaffirm those values. And I, I, I do think um, that we can get there. It's not going to be easy. <laughs> For certain, but I mean, if we look at you know policing now, right? Like property crimes, whoa, like that's a huge deal, right? Like, you know, you get robbed, like the police are going to show up, right? So, um, so it is, it is uh, possible, I think, for them to to pay attention to this to this um, issue. And I know that you know other women have other opinions, but um, this that this is the way that I, you know I think that we should go. So. Um... This is reminding me of something that um, I've mentioned before on this radio program, and also I, I think it's just it's just really important. I I have this friend Charlotte Watson who used to run. Excuse me, I'm gonna cough. <coughs> excuse me. Um, I have this friend Charlotte Watson who used to run the domestic violence program for the state of New York, and she also ran a, a battered women's shelter, uh, my sister's place, and now as a court advocate for women in the state of New York and she's great i just i just love her she's um i've told this story a lot that that she asks basically asks every man she sees what it'll take for men to stop beating on women and she's mm-hmm. she's completely relentless you know you get in a taxi cab with her and she'll ask the taxi driver you know it's like don't get on a subway with this woman it's just insane you know <laughs> she's she's great and oh and she has a soft east texas drawl you know so she seems very non-imposing and then it's like just surprises every guy by saying so what's it going to take for men to stop beating on women and anyway um her answer is that it will take other men doing it that women can't do it by themselves and she thinks it will partly take men saying you know i heard you call your girlfriend a bitch so i'm not going to play basketball with you anymore and um and and what do you think about that well i um I think she's right. <laughs> I, 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 I mean, I mean, I, I think that well, it's it's kind of silly for me to even ask that. I'm sorry because <laughs> because it's like, um, okay, so basically somebody is beating the crap out of you. What's it going to take for them to stop? Well, it's going to take them stopping. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and I think you know the consequences. Um, you know, they can be you know less harsh. Like I'm, you know, I'm not going to play with you now. Um, or, you know, more, more, more serious, but I do think that men do have a, have a very important role to play. And sometimes I think that that, um, sometimes I think they get it wrong. And sometimes I think they, they kind of want to come in, you know, and call themselves a feminist and, you know, be part of this and, and kind of take over, right. This work that women have been doing when really they need to be focusing on themselves, um, masculinity. They need to be talking with young boys. Like they need to be redefining masculinity, like as as a concept as it relates to their lives. Um, and more men need need to be doing that and working with other men and speaking to other men. Um, and and yeah, and just and just stopping. <laughs> um, you know, something that I've been thinking about a lot privately, but I haven't. Really, I haven't talked about ever publicly before. Is do you remember the big the Jody Arias case in Arizona a couple years ago? She was a woman who um, killed her boyfriend, and 
the the point is that there was a um, it was happening at the same time that the Oscar Pistorius trial started, mm-hmm. and what really struck me was the complete difference in how they were covered. That um, Jody Arias was, according to the media, just this terrible, horrible woman who she's a demon. She's you know they really dehumanized her, and I'm not. I don't know enough about her to defend her or not. My whole point is just the media coverage. And on the other hand, Oscar Pistorius, the Olympic guy who shot his, shot and murdered his, his, um, girlfriend, um, there was actually a headline that he was a fallen hero. Mm-hmm. And it just, it struck me that from, in many ways, that's, um, that was they were both just this sort of manifestation of the woman hatred that is really endemic in this culture. If a guy does it, you know, I mean, if a guy murders a woman, it's like, well, you know, boys will be boys, and he screwed up. Yeah, too bad for him because he can't be in the Olympics anymore. Mm-hmm. And if a woman kills a man, then she's a demon, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Right. Which I mean, and that that puts women in, in such a tough position because if you don't do anything. Then people are, well, why did you stay with him? Why did you stay with him, right? If she's trying to get out, um, but she can't, you know, the police aren't helping, you know, she has no money, you know, she's got a few kids or whatever, right? So she does nothing and she's blamed and then she she gets fed up and, and, you know, and she does something and then she gets blamed. So it's like there's no there's no way for women to move uh, when it's when it's um, situated like that, right? When we when we get um, constructed like that. So it's, uh, yeah, it's really, really, really hard. And then, of course, you know, men, oftentimes when, when they're committing acts like this, it's, you know, uh, uh, as, as if he's this, this singular man, right? As if this isn't like a, a, a structural systemic problem, right? It's, it's you know, well, he acts, you know, he accidentally shot her or whatever, um, as opposed to this is, you know, how many how many rapes really are, are happening today? Like how many murders are happening happening today? How many beatings? Like how many wives are getting you know or, or girlfriends are getting you know the crap kicked out of them right now? Right. So um, it just gets really de- decontextualized and 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 presented as these kind of individual crimes, right? As opposed to you know women hating misogyny. So we have about um, seven or eight minutes left and. I guess one question I would like to ask is if you could, if if suddenly tomorrow Canada put you in charge of a commission that was going to stop violence against women and especially against Aboriginal women in Canada. Okay, you can't make industrial civilization disappear and you can't make the settlers go away entirely. So okay. <laughs> we'll, we'll take that off the table for now. That You can do that next week. <laughs> okay, so in this week, like, what would you, what would you do? What would you? I guess I'm sort of asking policy. You know, you'd, you one thing is obviously you just said you'd you'd make the police do their jobs. Right. Um, so what would you do if you were in charge of some sort of, um, if you were given some power to some significant political and, you know, define power however you want here. I don't care. Um, if you were given some power to, and I know you got power already, but leave that aside. You know, you're given some political power what right. would you what would you do what, what what sort of policies would you what would you what would you want to see changed to um have sort of an immediate decrease of um the violence against women and against especially aboriginal women um well one one of the things uh well yeah obviously yes like make the police uh, do their job um and so so criminalize the men and uh, you know kind of like your friend said earlier when i'm talking about criminalization i don't necessarily mean throw them all in prison and lock them away forever like i'm not you know i'm not a big fan of prisons i think they're they're really harmful um but to have some consequences right so whether that those are social consequences political consequences you know criminal criminal consequences whatever um for men for men who are doing these these types of things the other thing that i would really address is um, well, two other things really, but they're related. Is the the hypersexualization of girls and um, young girls, uh, and I think you know our girls are growing up in a, in a culture that tells them from birth that uh, that sex is really all they have and their sexuality is all they have, um, and so really, and and I do think that images have power, and I think the world that we live in. Um, sexualizes girls from the get-go when they're being bombarded with these these images and, and young boys are being taught through those same really you know 
Um, so we're talking, you know, popular media portrayals of women, right? Uh, so advertising, you know, music videos, those types of things are teaching girls that they're only good for sex and teaching boys that girls are only good for sex. So um, really, I would kind of clamp down on that. <laughs> um, as well as, you know, I am an, an abolitionist and, and work for the abolition of prostitution. So uh, and I think that that is such a it's, it's very related um, to the issue of, of the murders and disappearances um, and really uh, implement the, the Swedish model here in Canada. We, we're working, we, we have like baby steps towards that, but we're not quite there yet. So um, so that as well as, as a, um, a guaranteed livable income um, so that, uh, you know, women have, have the ability to, um, to leave when they need to leave. Um, I mean, in Canada, unfortunately, there's been such a clamp down on, on um women's organizations so 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 much of the funding uh for women's organizations has been cut severely um so i you know i think we we need to you know in the moment right i mean and originally you know i'd like to work toward, toward a world where we don't have money and we, you know this capitalist system is not what's running everything um but to have so that women have means um and the ability to leave when they when they need to leave is you know, it's important, but, uh, yeah, a step back from that, you know, men, men need to stop and they need to have consequences. Um, and, uh, yeah, that's a good, that's a good question. I've never been asked that question before. <laughs> I, I think a couple, a couple things. One is that, um, I mean, you, you know, from my books that, um, my father is extremely violent and, um, my, you know, he raped my mother, my sister and me, my brother had epilepsy from blows to the head, broke my sister's arm. And one of the reasons my mom stayed with him is because um, it's exactly what you said about the economic situation, that she, you know, back in the 50s and 60s, what was she going to do? Um, you know, she couldn't, uh, there weren't alternatives. There weren't even battered women's shelters in the 50s and 60s for the most part. And so that whole question of economic independence is so huge. Um and then the other thing I was going to mention has to do with media portrayals. Two things, actually. One of them is um, Gail Dines has this great line about basically patriarchy. Um, you can sum up the socialization. I'm going to use the, the S word instead of the F word. Um, <laughs> but basically, patriarchy is um, socializes men to say, screw you, and socializes women to say, screw me. Mm. And that I was thinking about that when you said that about media portrayals. And then the other thing has to do with something that's just, just been a hobby horse of mine for years. It pisses me off that so often you'll see rape scenes in movies where the woman starts by fighting the guy off, and by the end of the scene, she's pulling him close. Mm -hmm. And you see this just time and time again. It's it's a pornographic trope that is in mainstream film all the time. It's B for Vendetta has a scene like that where he tortures the woman, and the first thing he does after she says after she gets out of He's put her in prison. First thing she says to him is, I love you. Mm -hmm. It's just nuts. Um, or Dr. Zhivago, where Evgrab is raping Laura. And I always contrast that with the rape scenes in um, a rape scene in Deliverance, where it's a guy getting raped, and it's one of the most horrific scenes in movie history. Mm -hmm. And so that's something, you know, we didn't ask me, but one of the things I would do is change those media portrayals immediately. Yeah. Um, so that we get to say, we, well, not even that we get to say no, but that the, the question isn't even on the table in the first place, right? I'm sorry, can you say it again? Oh, uh, so, not, so to, I, to, to change the media portrayals, not just so that women get to say no, but that men aren't demanding sex in the first place. Um, right. I think is, is you know, it's hugely important. And one of the other things that, that, I, that I would add to that as well, especially in the cases of our um, Aboriginal women and girls, is we really do need to have um, access to our lands uh, are an inalienable right. To, we we like we we don't get to give that away <laughs> in a treaty. That that are, is our right um, to be caretakers of our lands, um, as well as our cultures and our languages. Um, I know that I've worked with a lot of women and girls um, who who really need to. They, they, I mean, I need that. That's what sustains me. And I know that you know women who are struggling. Um, that really helps with their with their ability to um, to get that that 
uh, tape that plays over and over again that you're worthless, you're worthless, you're worthless. It, it stops that tape, right? Um, to be able to to re to reconnect and and part of that, you know, is, is also related to um, you know the the environmental destruction. So we need we we need to have our lands in order to to find out who we are and where we where we come from. So our the way that we, we are, we are the land, if, if I can say it in that way. Um, so we, we need we need those things um, to be able so that if we do have the economic freedom to leave, that, that we do that because we, you know, we, we value ourselves um, and the world values us as well. Right. The one thing I know is that the land never tells you that you're worthless. Mm hmm. Um, you going to say something? Oh, no. <laughs> um, so we have like one minute left. So if you could have, what do you want the, the listeners to this interview, what do you want them to take away from it? And what do you, what do you want them to do? Well, I want them to know that there is always hope. And I know sometimes I feel like, ah, it's too big. It's too complex. Um, but it's actually not. Um, it's actually quite simple. Um, and so I want people to feel hopeful and that we, we can, we can do this. Um, and to do, there's a number of things they can do, but one of the things that they can do is to go to the website for the Feminist Alliance for International Action. So the website is fapia uh, slash afi.org. Just Google it, uh, Feminist Alliance for International Action, um, and sign on to our solidarity network. So we're building this network um, uh, to get people uh, more aware of, of the murders and disappearances and to support the, the human rights of um, Aboriginal women and girls. So thank you so much for being on the program, and I would like to thank people for listening. My guest today has been Cherry Smiley. This is Derek Jensen for Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network.